Jonathan is still on vacation. He should be back sometime later this week. So in the meantime, Parker Hansen is going to be speaking to us this morning. We're, we're blessed to have not only him, but his girlfriend, his grandmother, his mom, his dad, and I guess brother. Is that right? I'm jealous because I never preached to my mom, my dad, my sister, at one time or another, my girlfriend. My kids have heard me preach a lot of times, <laughs> but uh, it's a blessing to have that support. So Parker, is, he lives in Salem, or that's where his home is from, just up the road a little ways. And he's presently going to Freed Hardman College, and during the summer break, he's at the, the, the school of, uh, where is it, yeah, the Northwest School of Discipleship, where Darren uh, Williamson is at. I remember when we had our classes in the back last year, uh, he's working under him as a, an internship, and we're blessed to have, have Parker here this morning. And I trust that Parker is not only here, he's not here to just have something to say, but he has something to say. Brother, preach the word. Good morning. Thank you guys for being here today and being very welcoming and friendly. Um, it's very nice to go to a completely different congregation but feel welcome like I've been here for a long time. So about two weeks ago, I went on a backpacking trip with the other Northwest School of Discipleship interns and a few AIM missionaries from Lakeview Church of Christ in Washington. And it was a good trip, but packing all of my stuff up into the woods sucked. It was the worst. It was only like 45 pounds on my back, which is like a third of my weight because I'm small. But that began to weigh a lot over a long time. And there was a lot of suffering and weakness that was there when we were moving our stuff from here to there. And so I began to start thinking about suffering a lot that week because I did a lot of that. It was physical suffering, um, and it's not that great, not that great of a deal of suffering. There's a lot of worse things that could happen to me, but I started to think about suffering in our lives and how suffering is in our lives. It's something that everybody has to deal with, and it's something that we all experience. And that once I put that pack down, once I got, got to our destination and we could just rest, it felt so good, and it was so fulfilling and reassuring. And I think that's a good analogy for the way that life is. Through God, our suffering and weakness can be made into power, and that's what I want to talk about today. Once we put down that heavy weight and shed that weight because of God, we can live again. It's through God that we receive our strength that we need for everything that we do, and it's once that we put that pack down that we can truly stop and see the glory of God. Because when when we got up to that mountain, we were in the goat, the goat rocks wilderness, I think it was called. It was up in this hilly area in between Mount Rainier and Mount Adams. And once, you, once we sat down, we could just see everything and you could just enjoy God's creation. But when we had those packs on, it was very hard to just enjoy anything. <laughs> so today I wanna to talk about how God has given us the power to overcome our suffering and have true joy in life and in the next life. Um, and on that trip, the minister from Lake Future to Christ, his name was Brent, um, and he read a scripture to us at the very end of the trip, and it was 2 Corinthians verses, or chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And it reads like this. Paul's talking about how God gave him some visions about what the heaven, heavens look like. And then he begins to talk about how he's not going to boast in that, but he's going to boast in his suffering. And he says, So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, 
a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This passage has a lot to say about suffering and weakness in the world and how God relates to it. So to start, let's just get an overview of what suffering is and weakness. The first thing is that suffering and weakness are kind of correlated. Paul connects these two things in verse 10, where he he talks about weakness and insults and hardships, and they're all together. Our weaknesses kind of lead to suffering, and suffering leads to weaknesses. And it also is apparent that suffering and weakness is not enjoyable. It sucks, and we all know that. We all deal with that. And suffering is also all over Scripture and all over our lives. Throughout the entire Old Testament, you can see how the Israelites suffer for things that they have done and for things they haven't done. And you can see how Adam and Eve suffer. And we can see how Jesus suffers. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 24 through 28, Paul describes what he suffered. He says, um, he says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes and often near, and sorry, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many sleepless, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me from anxiety for all the churches. I don't think Paul is trying to make you envious or like make you think that he's higher than you for suffering all these things, but he's just listing how life has been for him. And we've all suffered through things like that. There's some of you out there who have suffered greatly. And I know that. And in the beginning of Scripture, Adam, we can see that Adam and Eve suffer. These, scripture starts with suffering. Adam and Eve suffer in Genesis. After they sin, God says that Adam will have to toil in the fields for the rest of his life. And he also says that Eve will have pain multiplied in childbirth. God tells them that life will be a life of suffering from now on. It's just going to be a reality. Until the one who will crush the snake comes Will they suffer? And so God begins this. He tells them that it will end someday. He tells them that he will make it right someday. But in the meantime, we're going to have to suffer. And then the Israelites suffer a lot in the Old Testament, again, for things they have done and for things they didn't do. The book of Job is all about Job's suffering. And it's the, it's the whole question about Job. Job didn't do anything wrong, but yet he has to suffer. And then people suffer in the New Testament. All over the New Testament, there's people that Jesus heals that have been suffering for years. People who have been crippled or blind or have skin diseases or whatever. And then ultimately, Jesus suffers. Jesus, the one who's perfect, who didn't sin at all, had to suffer too. And so we all have suffered in our lives, and we all will suffer. And so that's just kind of a reality of how life is. And suffering is kind of mysterious. We don't know why it has to happen or sometimes how it happens or how it comes about, how it all leads to you in that one moment and makes you have to suffer. And it can be hard to deal with. We know that people suffer for things that they have done, like in Judges 2, 11 through 15. In Judges, God kind of deals with the Israelites and they do this cycle of sin where they, ha- where they follow God and then they leave God and then God lets them suffer so that he can show them his love and what it's like to be with God. And chapter 2, verses 11 through 15 says this. 
And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. This is after Joshua died. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord, and he served the Baals and the Asheroth. So the, anger of the Lord, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of the surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn them, and they were in terrible distress. So there's instances where people do things that cause themselves to suffer. And we've done that too. We've sinned and we've caused ourselves to suffer. But we also cause other people to suffer too for things that we've done. Sometimes good people suffer for no apparent reason, that they, like no reason that they should have to suffer. Job is an example of this. In Job 2.13, it says that Job's suffering was very great, but Job also did nothing wrong. <laughs> and one of the most horrible types of suffering is when children have to suffer. They never deserve what they get sometimes. And the unfortunate thing is that whenever major conflicts in the world happen or whenever something big happens in the world, children are always there. They're always in the midst of it, and they didn't choose that. And so that's the thing that just happens. Suffering and weakness is everywhere, and it can be very discouraging. It may seem like it never ends. It may seem like it's unavoidable. And it just hurts. And so it can make life hurt. And that's what Satan wants. Satan wants us to dwell on that, on how our suffering has hurt us. But the one thing that Paul tries to tell us is that although suffering exists, although it's everywhere, and it's from the beginning of your life until the end, we can overcome it through Christ. God's given us a way out, and God's given us the hope that that's not going to be the reality forever. So what does God tell us in 2 Corinthians, in our verse that we were looking at? He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I lost my place. Um, and God does not take pleasure in our suffering either, and he's given us a way out. In Ezekiel 18, 23, I should have marked these out. In Ezekiel 18, 23, and verse 32, and then again in chapter 33, verse 11, God says that he does not delight in the death of anyone. He tells them that if they don't follow him, they will die. But he does not want that to happen. God doesn't want to watch us suffer, ever. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6 tells us that God wishes for all to come to repentance. He wants us all to be saved. And 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says that God is allowing suffering to happen and allowing it to continue in order that people can enter into his kingdom. And Romans 8 says this too. It talks about how creation groans itself. Creation is suffering. And it, creation waits, is waiting for the day that God is going to redeem us. And then he says also that we groan inwardly as we wait for a redemption in Romans 8. And so God has given us Christ and the Spirit to help us, but we still have to endure suffering and weakness in this, in this life in the meantime. And our God does not create suffering, but uses it for his own good purposes. Satan still does the work that he does, but God is powerful enough to turn that around and use it for his own purpose. There's a lot of you out there who've suffered and then have turned that suffering into some way that you can serve other people. That's how God works. He allows you to suffer so that you can help those around you, so that you can be a better person and be more powerful. Paul suffered a lot, but then he was able to serve the church a lot more. He, we have a lot of our scripture from Paul, even though all that happened to him. Job suffered for no good reason, but we can learn a lot from Job because of that. We have a record of his talks with God, and we can, there's so much wisdom and knowledge there because Job suffered, and Job learned stuff too. Israel themselves, when they struggled, their, their name means struggled with God, 
But because they made mistakes and because they suffered, we have an account of that and we can learn from them. And they can also learn from themselves. So it's not, suffering is not for no reason anymore. Because Jesus has, has been sent for us and Jesus was crucified, we have a reason for it. And there's, it will end and it's not for nothing. Those who don't have the hope of God, they suffer and then there's nothing after that. That's a terrible fate. We have the hope that there will be an end to that and that it will be good in the end. And even Jesus was crucified in weakness and, and suffered on the cross. 2 Corinthians 13 verses 3 through 4 says this, Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Even our king was weak, but was raised in power. So God takes weakness and makes it powerful through his power. He shows his power through, through our weakness. There are all sorts of stories in the Bible of God doing this. There's Moses. Moses was a, a bad speaker, and he, talk, he tells God this. He says, God, I don't want to do this. I'm really bad at speaking. But Moses became one of the greatest leaders of Israel in the Old Testament. David defeats Goliath, that, that story that we always talk about. David was this little guy and this giant, but yet David wins through the power of God. The Israelites themselves weren't that strong. They were just this nomadic people, and then they move into this land and are able to carve out this huge space for themselves through God and not through their own power. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 through 31, God, or Paul explains how God uses weakness to show his own power. 25 through 31 says this, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble of birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are Christ Jesus, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let no one boast, or let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul tells us that we have power in the Lord through our smallest, or through our weaknesses, I guess. Our smallest power is made great through God. And God's weakest power is stronger than anything we could ever have. Jesus is our foremost example of God's power and weakness. Jesus was weak on the cross through his human body, but then he was raised to power through God. And so we need to allow God to work through us and work through our weakness and suffering in our lives. Brent McFarland from Washington said this about strength. We sometimes pray about God giving us strength to overcome temptation and overcome weakness. But the thing is that we already have that. Through Jesus, God has already given us the strength to overcome that temptation and that power. So what we need to do is realize that and it and just worship God because of that. God's given us the power to overcome all the sin and all the death of the world. And so there's power in the things that we suffer through. And things aren't, things don't happen just for no reason. So whatever you're going through and whatever's happening in your life, there is an end to it. And you can hope that God will make it right in the end. And you can hope that What's happening to you right now won't be the end of it. And so as we continue worshiping today, if you are suffering or if there's anything going on or if you would even like to be baptized and become part of God's church and receive the power that God wants to give you, you can come forward and do that as we stand and sing.